I want to go back to what you said about potentially the government taking care of this process. Mm. How is that administered? How is it funded? Is this from taxes alone? How do you? What's this system of government? What what do you, what would well, the, this look the, like? The, the government the government creates money by running a deficit. And this again, people get this entirely wrong. So, like with Stephanie Kelton, who's a good friend of mine, uh, has been. If you read a book called The Deficit Myth, you may have seen that. And she's trying to communicate, like just what I'm saying, how banks create money is different to what the theory thinks. The way the government creates money is also different to what the theory thinks. So the government creates money by spending more than it gets back in taxes. Okay. And when it does that, it increases the uh, deposit accounts because if you spend more on people than you tax than people, then the deposit accounts will increase. And on the ledger, on the asset side of the ledger, the reserves go up. Okay. So the way it's actually done is when a, when a government spends on the public, it sends money with the you know, earmark, put this money in, you know, in, 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 in Julie's account and Peter's account and so on with the actual account numbers. So that's transferred to reserve accounts and the banks honour that by for everything they get in reserve, they put the same thing in deposits. So if the taxing, if the spending exceeds the taxation, the deposits rise and the reserves rise. Mm. Yeah. That's the thing. Now, people think the government borrows. Well, it doesn't borrow. It sells bonds, which is very different because the banks used not to make any money out of reserve. They weren't paid for the amount of money they had on reserve. They are now after the financial crisis, but they weren't beforehand. Mm. So effectively, reserves were a barren asset and banks wanted to minimize the amount they held. So the government would then say, we're going to sell bonds equivalent to the deficit. But we, they ran a deficit of, a, say, $100 billion. They then said, we're going to sell $100 billion worth of bonds. Now, because of the deficit, the, the government had created $100 billion worth of reserves. So what they were saying to the banks is, would you like to swap a non-income earning, non-tradable asset for an income earning, tradable asset? And the banks say, yes, please, and make the swap. Mm. So there's never any problem about buying bonds. So the whole thing about the debt ceiling you're going through right now is, is, is a joke. Uh, it, it doesn't matter at all. So the government has a basically limitless capacity to do that. It's, whether it's a good idea or not is another story, but it has no physical limits on it doing that. And so we have a, we have theories of, of bank behaviour and, and government money creation, which are taught by the mainstream that are wrong. And so a new economics has to get that right. Mm. What would it look like? Would people be taking out loans from the government exclusively if there were was no bank oh, no, no, that, that, that that's not what i'm uh, see, more thinking about there but but yeah that's if you had just a, like a government money system the government i was gonna get a drink by the way my voice is getting a bit sore hang on a sec sure sure actually i have two sides okay when the government um if the government uh runs a deficit dollar for dollar that becomes a surplus for the private sector so the government goes into negative equity when it creates money, and that negative equity, dollar for dollar, creates positive equity for the private sector. The basic logic being that when you're looking at financial assets, a financial asset is a claim on somebody else. So if you add up all the claims on somebody else, you get zero. Okay? Right. So if the government uh, runs a deficit, so it has spends more than it gets back. It's creating claims on itself by doing that. That's how it creates money. And right. it backs that effectively by owning the country. So the non-financial asset of the you know nominal value of America is what backs the capacity of the American government to create money like that. Now, the government does it. If it goes into negative equity, then on balance, the rest of the economy is an identical positive equity. In that situation, if you have positive equity, you don't need to borrow as much because you've got actually spare cash. Mm. So if you look back in the 50s and 60s when the government was running a substantial deficit, people weren't borrowing all that much. Two reasons. One, they'd been through the Great Depression and the Second World War. They were very wary about being in debt. But they didn't need to because the government was creating net uh, financial assets for them by running a deficit. So when you have a substantial deficit, there's less need to borrow in the first place. And what dangers are associated with running a substantial deficit? Because it seems like people are panicking about this all the time. Yeah, they're, they're panicking for reasons which... Henry, I just wrote a blog post about Henry Ford and and um, 
Thomas Edison was trying to say, stop panicking. This is normal behavior for a government. Mm -hmm. uh, but they do panic about runaway inflation. Now, the only times they had runaway inflation or hyperinflation event has been in the case of things like the Weimar Republic or, the, or Zimbabwe, Weimar Republic, where the French tried to destroy the, the uh, German economy and the, and the Germans continue paying reparations. That was, by the way, 10 years before Hitler. People think it, think Weimar inflation led to Hitler. No, it was actually austerity that led to Hitler. Uh, a serious period of austerity in the early 1930s. Well, Hitler was and very much a product of the decisions that were made earlier to some extent, or the, the activities. Oh, he was, he was. Yeah, yeah but, but, uh, but you know, what, what got into power was, was austerity. I mean, the government running up this deficit by interject by injecting money into the system, the government inherently lead, like inflates the money supply. Right? This seems like yeah. A, but, the, but you have a if you have a growing economy. You're going to have to have a, you're going to have a growing money supply as well. Okay. Right, and it, you know, one thing I came across when I was getting ready to talk to you was the idea that deflation could also be dangerous and and mm. lead to different catastrophes. How does that work? Well, the person who first realized that was Irving Fisher back in the 1930s in a paper called The Debt Deflation Theory of Great Depressions and it happened to him personally. Mm. Um, so if you have borrowed a large amount of money and you're heavily in debt and prices are falling, then as a business, what you'll do is you'll cut your own prices and try to attack people inside your own doors so you manage to pay your debts while your competitors don't. The trouble is your competitors do the same thing. So the price level falls more than the debt level falls, and in fact, your actual effective level of debt rises. Now, empirically, that's what happened between 1929 and 1933. When you look at the level of private debt in America, it was falling from 1930 to 1933, but the debt ratio was rising. And the reason was the GDP was falling faster than the debt was falling because GDP was falling, say, 10%, and prices were falling by 10%. So you had a 20% plus fall in nominal GDP, as people paid their debt down by 10%. So the debt ratio rose between 1930 and 1933, even though the level of debt fell. So mm -hmm. that's the real danger. And, and there's no way out of that unless you have another an alternative source of money creation. Because if you if you have to continue, or you have dank bankruptcy on a grand scale, bankruptcy writes the debt off, but it also destroys the money. So you have this collapse. Uh, so interesting because normally we think about inflation as as being the painful piece of the puzzle right we see the prices go up in the store for basic commodities mm. and we experience that as painful as opposed mm. to the more the more meta crisis of the strain on the financial structures themselves mm. Mm. <laughs> and that's the main danger and that's my my, my, my first blog was called debtdeflation.com for that reason <laughs> so but the idea is that you would always have a source of money, and it seems like a really hard balance to strike because if you have too much money, you do have hyperinflation, right? Yeah. Well, hyperinflation tends to be destructive resources and people trying to paper over the destruction. That's, you know, it's like the, in, in Zimbabwe, it was, you know, kicking all the white farmers off the farms and expecting their workers to be able to take their places when they didn't have the training or the resources. And you had a collapse in uh, economic output of Zimbabwe and then they just continued pumping out money and pensions and and so on. So th that sort of experience, about three countries have experienced it. Um, if I'm in Germany, obviously, after the First World War, Argentina uh, to a large degree, and then also Zimbabwe. Never a country like America or Britain, and never a country that hadn't been through some sort of large-scale destruction. So, it's it's something which uh, the the Weimar Republic really scarred our minds, you know, for uh, globally for a long, long time. But it wasn't necessarily the um, um, you know the, the widespread phenomenon we're always afraid of. So people think oh, running a deficit will cause. Um, you know, we're going to end up in Zimbabwe. If you look at the average deficit for the American economy between 1900 and 2014, it's 2.5% 2 of GDP every year on average. Okay. Take out the wars, it's 2.3% of GDP every year. So it's a normal situation for a government to run a deficit, and it tends to be related to the rate of growth of the economy. And so are you suggesting that hyperinflation isn't 
a risk after something like, let's say we go to universal basic income and the government mm. starts to just make that money out of nothing. 